Welcome to the Hockey Writers Prospect Corner, a show with our top prospects writing crew, bringing you the latest news, analysis, scouting reports, mocks, rankings, and much more. From the world juniors to the NHL draft floor, from the farm to the NHL, our team covers everything that happens in the world of prospects. So sit back, grab a notebook, and get ready for Prospect Corner. Prospect Corner. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Prospect Corner presented by the Hockey Writers. Today, we're going to be taking a look at the latest edition of my 2023 NHL draft rankings, which ranks the top 96 prospects, which is equivalent to the first three full rounds of the draft. Uh, I am your host, Logan Horn, and today I'm joined by my co hosts, Peter Barracchini and Matthew Zator. Matt, how are you doing this fine morning, afternoon, <laughs> nighttime? I'm doing good. Um... You know, playoffs are just around the corner, not for the Canucks, but, uh, you know, we can watch <laughs> playoff hockey and uh, it's always fun to have. And then, of course, the draft is uh, getting closer by the day. And like you said, more rankings coming out. So excited to get going. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, relatively, maybe the playoffs are just around the corner for the Canucks yeah. relative to like the grand scheme of the franchise that might count. True. If you think they'll make <laughs> it next year, who knows? Uh, Peter, how are you doing? Yeah, uh, I mean, Matt, I know you don't have playoff hockey, but at least you have the, you know, draft lottery to kind of look forward to. But there's that. But yeah, you know, I'm just I'm just excited right now because like spring's around the worst. We're in spring right now. I'm yeah. I'm just sick and tired of the snow right now. It's sunny right now with, looking out my window and I'm just like, beautiful. man, <laughs> it's beautiful weather right now. Even though it's like four degrees, I feel like going out in a shirt and t like shorts and t-shirt right now. Yeah. But that's probably pushing it a little bit right now. But I, I'm just excited for the warmer weather yeah absolutely aren't we all uh oh i will say matt it feels like the most vancouver canucks thing ever uh for them to finally win the draft lottery but to end up in like 12th place and end up with like the second or third overall pick instead of first overall (laughs) it just seems perfect it just seems like it would line up great (laughs) and they're also they can't stop winning games for some reason just destroying their lottery odds but you know you take the good with the bad normal (laughs) <laughs> yeah you're not a fan of a hockey team because it's easy anyway all Never right is. um no it's not easy i guess you know that too Peter. Um, oh yeah <laughs> uh, even even when you do make the playoffs it's not always great um all right Dang. we're gonna get started here uh as i mentioned we're gonna go over some of my draft rankings um and we're gonna start this one i'm gonna go through real quick because there's not a lot to talk about here not much has changed in like five months four four or five months uh, maybe we can argue a little bit about placement and then that fifth overall guy. But when I'm ranking the top guys in the 2023 draft at the moment, it's Connor Bedard, large gap. Um, personally, I, as we kind of talked about last week, I've bumped Michkov back up. I have him at, at second overall right now based on pure talent. There's a lot of context going into it. I do not think he will be second overall, but he's my second overall prospect talent wise, followed very closely by Adam Fantilli. And then another little gap, I think, before Leo Carlson at four. And then at five right now, I have Zach Benson. Um, I've just been, I'm just a big fan of his. And he's just starting to edge out Will Smith for me in my eyes. It's been a bit of a battle back and forth there. Um, I I don't know. I've just, just the compete level with Benson. He just fights so hard and that's really entertaining, but also he's just got a ton of skill. He's the best player on his team that had two top 11 picks just last year for him to still be the most productive and probably the most talented player on that team is wild. Um, So Matt, I'm going to come to you here. Uh, What are your thoughts on the top five? Is there anyone that you would, you'd argue against other than maybe the the (laughs) second and third overall, or is that basically the same thing that 90% of people agree with that top five? It's, I mean, looking at the top five, like though, like you say, the only one that really changed Benson going into five and Will Smith dropping to six. I mean, it wasn't that big of a change, but yeah, Michkov going to two. I mean, you know, we talked about it last week about uh, Van Tilly being the second overall pick and all that, but yeah, I, yeah, you know, you can't really argue against Michkov being two. I mean, he's got tons of skill. Like I said, he he's probably going to score fifty goals in the NHL at some point. But, uh, you know, talent wise, he is, I mean, very, very close to Fantilli and, you know, they're totally different players, but, uh, you know, 
two, three. I mean, I wouldn't be, you wouldn't be angry to see that if uh, Mitch Cup did go to, I, but like you said, context is, is going to be huge in this and he probably won't be second overall because of that. But yeah, I don't disagree with any of the top five here. I mean, Benson's really impressed. Um, he impressed me last year, uh, last season as well. And he was much younger um, on the Winnipeg ice. And like you said, there's a lot of skill in that team. And there was a lot of skill in that team last season as well. And he mm-hmm. stood out. So, I mean, it's no surprise what he's doing. He is smaller, but uh, the talent alone, yeah, definitely top five pick. Yeah, he's he's been, you're right that he was impressive even last season when Scouts are going to watch the Winnipeg Ice play to, to go watch uh, Matt Savoy or go watch Connor Geeky. But then they're like, who's this kid? What's going on here? <laughs> and uh, he's been, uh, I guess the rest is history. Uh, well, it's also future. Hasn't come yet. <laughs> anyway, uh, Peter, what are your thoughts in that top five? Any Anything you'd do differently? What are your, what are your thoughts there? Uh, where do I begin? Uh, <laughs> nah, it, 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 it's it's a really it, it's basically my top five right now, except for the fact that I still have you know the top three centers going one, two, three, and then Mitchkov right after. Um, but it wouldn't surprise me if Mitchkov does get back into that top three because of what he was able to do, especially on a you know Sochi HK team. That was way at the bottom of the standings, and he still managed to put up like you know twenty points in twenty seven games. That's mm-hmm. still very impressive. And then I believe he was still kind of either under or just over a point per game in the MHL playoffs when he got sent down. So clearly, whatever struggles he was having, I know he also dealt with an injury at the beginning of the season. Whatever was plaguing him, ice time, whatever. That's but that's all in the rear view rear view mirror right now with Mitchkov because he's uh, playing at a high end level right now. We all know what he could do on the ice. His shot is just absolutely fantastic. You're you, no matter where you are on the ice or where he is on the ice, expect a goal. Even on the most ridiculous low percentage angle that may not even have a chance of going in, there's a chance it's going in, especially off of, if it's coming off of Mitchkov's stick. So. If he's able to do that uh, consistently and he's able to try and move up, and then again, I think teams may want to have like a little, may have their doubts a little bit less reserved right now because of the fact that there was an interview on NHL.com where he said he's willing to go and like his sights are on the NHL. As soon as his contract's done, he wants to come on over. That's his dream. So maybe teams are a little bit saying, hey, yeah, we may draft him second overall or third and wait the three years because mm-hmm. it's going to be worth it no matter what. Yeah, I mean it's it's definitely gonna be a tough situation. It's 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 always the case, but it's a real investment making that pick because you won't see any return on that investment for mm-hmm. at least three full seasons. And sometimes that's the case with first rounders anyway. It's definitely yeah. the case typically with later round picks that turn into NHL players. But um, you know, it's a tough sell to an owner of a team that wants to turn it around and make a profit. Um, to say, well, we're going to use the third overall pick to add this guy that won't see North American ice for almost four years. Mm-hmm. That's a tough sell, um, but it's clear that he's doing it for his own development to grow up as a person. And to, he's going to be like 21 when he starts the mm-hmm. NHL. He's not going to be like 35. Yeah. Like, it's not like yeah. you're waiting <laughs> until he's past his prime. Like, he's going to be ready to go. He's going to be most likely a legit top six, maybe top line contributor right away. Kind of like Kirill Kaprizov, Artemi Panarin, maybe Um, that's the plan. Um, And yeah, you guys kind of, kind of went, went over some of it. Like uh, when I look at his skill and his, his offense his his goal scoring, um, it really does make me think of that um, insane Kent Johnson goal just the other night where he uh, circled the zone made a pass or made a pass, made a little dangle between his own skates just to make some space for himself behind the net and then scored a Michigan goal. Like one of the cleanest (laughs) lacrosse moves we've seen in the NHL, maybe the cleanest. That's the kind of stuff you can expect from Michkov, honestly, is just that skill, that hockey sense to just like manipulate where defenders are moving, make space for himself, attack, score goals. Like (laughs) uh, that's what you can expect. I'm huge, huge fan. I know you guys are too, just the you know nerves around some of the the outside factors mm-hmm. for sure changes where he lands um okay i'm gonna go through the rest of the top 10 here that i have where there's been a lot more movement i feel like a lot more room for debate as well even just like 
if you guys were to be like, why isn't this guy in your top 10? I'd probably agree with you. It's really, <laughs> really hard to narrow it down. Uh, but currently at sixth overall, I have Will Smith. Uh, just bumped down from five. Seventh overall, I have David Reinbacher, top defenseman in the class for me. Uh, eighth overall, I have Nate Danielson. Ninth, I have Oliver Moore. And 10th, I have Colby Barlow. So there's a lot of guys there. There's plenty of guys that could make it in there. Um, like Andrew Crystal. I, where is he? I think I have him at 11. He's just outside. Yeah, at 11. I don't Up to your preference, like <laughs> Gabe Perot, Ryan Leonard, Riley Height. Those guys could be close. They're all quite close for me. I think they're all in my top 17, 18, maybe. Um, what are your guys' thoughts on that, Peter? What do you what do you think of that group? Um, anyone you think is way too high, a little too low, someone should be in that top 10? Um, I you could definitely make a case for Nate Danielson. I, and not this is a bad surprise, but it's a very pleasant surprise considering how consistent he has been all season. And you know, maybe there is possibly that talk where maybe he should be getting consideration for a top 10. I know for a fact that he's definitely in my top 15 right now, but you know, top 10 mm-hmm. is definitely a possibly good high expectation or like projection of where he could possibly go. And, you know, I said this last week too, I'm really happy that to see Colby Barlow in your top 10 as well, because he gets a lot of, you know, backlash because he's like de- developing too quickly and everything like that he may not have a high enough ceiling and all that but based on what you see right now if you want somebody that could jump in right away that has the mindset the physicality the awareness and offensive capabilities that he has especially with his shot why not take a chance on him in a top 10 position because he has a lot going for him right now and the fact that he's developing into kind of a two-way winger kind of thing uh or a kind of a uh, player mentality that to me would stick out even more because he's making that commitment. He's becoming well-rounded. So he's not just going to be a factor in one area of the ice. He's going to be one in the neutral zone, defensive zone. So to see him in the top 10 is really great to see. Yeah. I've, I've become a a pretty big fan of Barlow for sure. The maturity physically, but also just his play wise and, and leadership wise too. being the, yeah, being the captain of his OHL team, the Owen sound attack. Uh, he was named captain when he was still 17, which is kind of wild. Um, I, I can see him playing in the OHL again next year, but it's not going to be a challenge for him. Mm-hmm. So I hope, I truly hope he goes to an NHL team that can use him in the NHL next year. Or at um, least in, in the NHL. Mm. sure but with the chl agreement stuff um that, yeah that'd be that'd be a real challenge they can work mm. around it like like other teams have done and then maybe play them in the last half of the year back in junior kind of like with um brent clark and shane Wright this season um mm, yeah. but yeah big fan of his he kind of reminds me um just in these couple ways of uh brock besser in that uh at least what brock besser has kind of shown glimpses of and maybe not quite locked in at but a top six winger, legit goal scoring, two way game. Brock Besser hasn't done this, but Barlow is a really great penalty killer in the OHL right now. Um, looks like something that could translate just based on his size and speed. I don't know. I I like him a lot. I think he makes sense as a top ten pick. And uh, yeah, if you're big and you score goals, well, he's not that big. I think he's six <laughs> one. Yeah. But if you're big enough and you score goals, you're gonna you're gonna find a spot in the NHL. So big fan of his. Uh, Matt, what do you think of this top ten? These guys here. Any any thoughts there? <laughs> um, I'm still gonna, and I'm I'm still gonna stay on this with same as what I was with Coronado. I think Matthew Woods going closer to a top ten pick. But uh, you've got a 15, not that far away. But uh, I, I love I love Matthew Wood. You know this uh, by from last week, from previous weeks. I wrote his prospect profile as well. And I think he's close to a top 10 pick. And I'm going to stay on that until he doesn't become a top 10 pick. Sure. <laughs> Matthew Coronado, no one thought he was going to be 11th overall. And he did so. Um, yeah, so I, I'm, but overall, I mean, there's a lot of movement. I mean, you can move, like you, you guys said, like Gabe Perot could go into a top 10, uh, crystal could be a top 10. Um, mm-hmm. there's a lot of guys that can move into that, that range. Riley height, another guy that's, you know, you've got close to a top 10. He could definitely be there too. 
Mm -hmm. Um, so, I mean, there's going to be a lot of, I think there's going to be a lot of movement. Like you said, your next rankings are probably going to have another guy maybe move into that top 10. Who knows? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but overall, I mean, this top 10 is very solid. I think anyone's going to get a top 10 pick and getting any of these guys are going to be really happy with it. Um, you know, overall, I, yeah, I'd say the top 10 is pretty good. And Barlow is, you know, over time, as you guys talked about him, I keep looking, I'm like, well, maybe he is, maybe he does have a lot more than I think. Um, so, I mean, uh, yeah, Barlow, I think is still definitely a top 15 for me. So, you know, but yeah, overall, this top 10 looks really good. Well, thank you. Um, I, I do want to mention quickly, uh, Nate Danielson, as you guys kind of mentioned a little, like I, uh, he's risen quite a bit for me. He's up at eighth overall now on, on my list. Um, and he's been rising all year. He's been very consistent. Uh, he's got a very well rounded, like mature center, like game right now, um, as a junior, which is great. Like he's great on, uh, face-offs and both, both special teams. Um, and the points are starting to add up pretty well. I think he's like roughly in the top 20 in WHL scoring as a draft eligible, which is pretty impressive. It, doesn't seem that impressive because you see Bedard has like a 30 something point lead on second place at the end of the season. Um, but being like 18th, 19th overall in a league and scoring as a barely an 18 year old is impressive. Uh, especially though, when you look at that Brandon Wheat Kings team that he is the captain of, uh, they're not great. They've got Carson Bjarnason in net. Who's another, another solid uh, NHL prospect in this draft. But when it comes to teammate quality, uh, a lot of the the tape I've watched of Danielson, you'll see him tear through the opposing team through the neutral zone, get a clean uh, get a clean entrance into the offensive zone, tear down the wing, set up a great pass to the slot for a teammate who misses the puck entirely, <laughs> and you see that two or three times a game um, where he's just clearly. He's thinking too fast for his teammates, not in the way that he's like panicking and making like bad decisions, but just that he's too good for some of his line mates. And I do think that uh, given some higher quality teammates, I think his his point totals would be a little more impressive um, and probably help him out a little bit when it comes to draft discussion stuff. But I'm a big fan of his game, even if the points aren't astounding. Um, and then also, like you said, like you guys also said, there's still going to be plenty of movement. Um, the CHL playoffs can play mm. play a big part. Um, we saw that last year with Kevin Korczynski. He's rising all year. Mm -hmm. But then uh, that run that the uh, – that's the Thunderbirds, right? Seattle Thunderbirds? Yeah. Last year, that run they took through the playoffs was really impressive. It saw him jump up a ton in the draft and also um, – Reed Schaefer as well made his way into the first round really heavily on the back of that playoff run. So yeah. lots could change late. Someone like Grayson Sachin for the Seattle Thunderbirds could easily jump into the first round. You wouldn't have to twist my arm much to do that now, but if he has an impressive playoff run, maybe he's a top 20 guy. You never know. There's a, a lot of time to go, even though the regular season's done for a lot of, a lot of junior teams. Yeah. Um, Lots can still happen. Um, okay, so now I actually I want to go over some uh, risers and fallers in my eyes, also kind of in my rankings from this one to the last one. And uh, we've all kind of picked a couple of them. So I'll, I'll get your guys' thoughts on these players and we can, uh, we'll take turns tackling these guys, talking about why we think they're, I don't know, why they're rising or falling in, in the, the draft coming up. Uh, Matt, I'm going to start with you. We're going to start with risers as well. Um, and you've got Gabe Perot. What are your thoughts on him? And uh, do you, why would you consider him a little bit of a riser lately? Maybe something like that. Well, I mean, looking at what Perot's done this season is just amazing. Uh, he's got 105 points of the U18 team, already 40 points in 20 games with the US NTDB juniors. Um, this guy can't be stopped. I mean, he just keeps getting points. It doesn't matter where, where he plays. And, you know, he's become a little bit of a power play specialist too. I mean, he's one, one of the better power play guys and probably will end up being that in the NHL. I mean, you're looking at the, at power plays in the NHL is very important. And if you have a guy that can just, just rack up the points with the man advantage is, is a huge advantage, huge advantage for the team uh, to have. So, I mean, 
and, and he's scoring goals too. I mean, he is a playmaker, but he's, you know, like I said, he's got 45 goals at the U18 um, and 18 at the juniors um, level there. So, I mean, he can score, but I mean, he's got great, great vision, a uh, great ability to know where his teammates are on the ice. I mean, he had six assists in one game in the world juniors. I mean, <laughs> that, that insane. I don't know what, what they won by nine to one. And he was in on six of those goals. So, I mean, and, you know, overall in the last bunch of games, he's got what five points, goal, four assists, an eight to one win. He's got a three game goal streak going on. I mean, overall, he's just rising because of his point production and the fact that he just keeps doing what he's doing. Very consistent player too, throughout the season. He's hasn't gotten much of a lull in points. I mean, he's not gone on these streaks where he doesn't get anything. Um, so, I mean, I, I think of, Overall, he could, like I said, he could jump into a top 10 uh, pick because, you know, teams teams factor in that, those power play of numbers and being able to uh, run a power play uh, as a, what is he, a winger, right? So, um, you know, being that type of playmaking winger, there's not a lot of them in the NHL that's those pure guys that can, you know, support a centerman that doesn't, that isn't a very good playmaker. Like I always go back to a guy like Ryan Kessler, it always, I think he'd be a much, he would have been a much more consistent goal scorer if he had a legitimate playmaking winger with him. And, you know, Perot can be that complimentary guy for a centerman like that. I think that's going to be huge once, um, once the draft gets going, because teams will look at this. I mean, playmaking wingers, they're, like I said, elite playmaking wingers. There's not a lot of them in the NHL. I mean, centermen, you can pick quite a few, but. Um, yeah, very big fan of Perot. He's, he's got that NHL pedigree already. He's got his dad was, you know, great, um, pretty consistent NHLer as well. Um, very long. He had a long career, mostly because he was great at faceoffs. I mean, that that's, that could that kept that him in the NHL quite a long time. So, um, yeah, very excited about Pro, and I'm not surprised to see him rise on um, on your rankings here. Sure. Yeah, I'm a big fan of his as well. Like you can. Say what you want about his size, maybe his defensive habits, um, and those aren't nothing. Um, but when you look at his point totals and his points per game rate, and you see that the only players in the history of the U18 team at the NTDP level, the only players with a higher rate than him are Will Smith, who's just a little <laughs> higher in the draft than him here, and Jack Hughes. You may have heard of Jack Hughes. <laughs> He just scored his 40th goal of the season the other night. And uh, if he didn't miss a few games, is well on pace to have 50 goals, 100 points this year, and very likely going to have a few more of those seasons through the height of his career. Not saying he's going to be Jack Hughes, but uh, Gabe Perot is pretty impressive. You can't ignore that either, um, yeah. although obviously power play helps. But also it helped Jack Hughes, so yeah. it's not perfect. But anyway. Uh, we'll move on to the next one here. Peter, you've got Bradley Nadeau here. Uh, what are your thoughts on Nadeau as a riser in this year's draft? Yeah, if there's any player that should get consideration for being a first rounder, it's definitely Nadeau. And, you know, throughout the whole entire season, like, he's just electric in everything that he does. He's just dynamic in everything with his his goal scoring, his passing, his playmaking abilities. Uh, transitional game he he can do it all offensively and he's just an absolute force in the bchl the only reason why he may not be getting as much recognition is because you know the bchl is more that tier below um you know the whl um you know ohl qmjhl if he was doing that at like the top junior level or even U ushl maybe there would be more of a spotlight on him mm -hmm. and you know, we always talk about size, how that's, you know, deciding factor. Um, you know, he's listed as 5'10", 163 pounds on elite prospects. And, you know, that may throw some teams off. Even some outlets maybe have him as 5'9", 160 or less than 150 pounds. But we see how well, you know, playmaking wingers can make an impact in the NHL, you know, not to I'm not saying that he's going to be these these kind of players, but Nikita Kucherov is 5'11", 180 pounds, and you know, look how well he's playing. I'm not, again just height 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 and weight differential is what I'm going for. 
You see what Mitch Marner is doing right now. When he was drafted, he was about 5'11", 5'10", 160 pounds. The same as kind of what we're seeing with Nato right now. And the Maple Leafs took him fourth overall. So there's a possibility that maybe if there's a team that wants to take a swing on a player, take it on Nato because he's definitely, you know, electric and he's got a high offensive ceiling based on what he could do because he's just a nightmare to go up against right now. Yeah, absolutely. I can't help but uh, you mentioned him just a little bit ago there, Matt. I think you mentioned him. Um, Nadeau reminds me a bit of Matt Coronado, um, the Flames prospect. Similar size and just mm-hmm. just on an offensive tear. Um, doesn't have the stick handling maybe of Coronado, but he has a better shot. Like you watch Bradley Nadeau play, and obviously he's playing in junior A, not in major junior, but... You watch the way he just tears past people. He's very quick. Um, and that shot is legit. It was one timer his wrist shot. Like it, that's a heavy shot, um, which is fun to watch. And I also am just fascinated by the um the the growth in the uh junior A to NCAA pipeline for Canadian mm-hmm. kids playing through juniors instead of going through the CHL. Uh just a it's just a different option, but uh I'm, I like it. I think it's interesting. CHL has had a bit of a monopoly on junior hockey in Canada. So it's kind of cool to see people trying something different. Adam Fantilli did that going to the USHL and then now in college and uh, Macklin Celebrini, who's going to be a top, a high prospect next year. is doing the same thing. Chicago steel in the USHL this year playing in uh, NCAA. Um, so I don't know. I'm, I'm fascinated by that path and the the popularity of it lately. So that's a cool thing that Nodo's doing as well. I'm a big fan of his. He's in my first round somewhere here. Um, I'll I'll do this one quickly because I've talked about him a lot lately. Uh, the last riser that I'm going to talk about is Dmitry Simashev. Uh, you guys have heard me talk about him plenty. You two specifically. Um, <laughs> I'm a big fan of his. His skating is top notch. I think it gives him a legit chance at being a, like a good two way player defenseman, not just defensively. I think there's more offense to his game than he's shown. And uh, in that way, at least, I'm not saying anything about his NHL, what he's going to be in the NHL, but he's he's really reminding me of um, of Mo Sider in his draft year, just how he's this this Euro kid that nobody knew about, and he's just kind of sort of sneaking onto the scene. And it's like, okay, he's big, strong, good defensively, offensive question mark. We see where Mo Sider took that from there, and it's been incredible. Mm-hmm. Um, who knows where Simashev will end up, but. Uh, Cause that's we're we're at that point now we've got it. He's got to prove it that he's got more offense, but um, I don't know. I, that's a comparison that's been standing out to me lately. And I also think like cider, he's not going to go sixth overall, but I think Simashev is going to surprise some people with how early he goes on probably day one of the draft, probably a lot higher than people are expecting. Um, okay. Now we're going to run through some, some fallers in this list and, Peter, I'll come to you first again here, or not first again, but first here, uh, with Edward Shala. Um, he's been kind of fallen. We've talked about that a few times, but he made a bit of a drop. I've had him in the top 10 consistently for a while, and this time I had him at 17, and I think from our conversations, you're relatively in agreement. What are your thoughts on Shala? Yeah, it's just a consistency thing. You know, I mean, obviously, you know, Players in Europe, you know, you, they're always in a struggle to try and get ice time. But even so, like, you just kind of notice him here and there, but he doesn't quite take the next step. And I really thought that, you know, you could try and maybe draw a comparison to, you know, Yuri Kulik uh, last season. But now, seeing all what he was able to do, like, he's playing at an incredible pace with the Rochester Americans right now. Mm-hmm. Um but I see like a, lo- a little bit more consistency with Coolidge than I did with uh, Shala right now. And obviously, you know, still young, still developing. But, you know, aside from one tournament this season, he has been hit or miss. He's been up and down. He just hasn't found that consistent stride. And even so, um, in the playoffs, aside from 14 points in 43 games, which, you know, still decent production, you know, zero points in six playoff games uh, in the check in the Czechia league right now. So um, mm-hmm. 
again, it's not that he doesn't have the skill set. He definitely does. The hardworking mentality, the playmaking, uh, underrated shot. He's he, he's a player that could do it all. It's just he needs to find that offensive consistency. Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head that, you know, it's it's tough to think so highly of him because of one tournament. Mm-hmm. The Helenka Gretzky tournament last summer, he was incredible, looked like a no doubt top guy for this year. Um, and that's kind of been where his reputation has come from is just that one tournament rather than everything else. Uh, his league play is impressive playing against grown men. It's not wildly impressive. It's not top 10 pick impressive, mm-hmm. really, in my eyes. He was good at the World Juniors, not great. Production wasn't really there which is fair. He was 17, I believe. And that's a U 20 tournament. So like, you don't expect him to dominate, but it would have been nice. Mm -hmm. And it's just gotten harder and harder to keep him up at that level. Um, There's always a couple of those guys who kind of are, are left up high on a lot of people's draft boards based on reputation rather than play. And uh, I think we're trying to correct for that a little bit and try to get a, get ahead of ourselves and uh, correct some mistakes there. Cause it, doesn't doesn't feel like he's earned earning that spot consistently. So it makes sense he's fallen a bit. Um, Matt, you've got Lucas Dragasevich here. I wouldn't say he's like a huge faller. I have him on this list personally because he's fallen kind of for me. But I'm curious if you have any thoughts on on that. Maybe you don't think he should be a faller, but but thoughts on why he could be falling a little bit, something like that. Well, I mean, I'm a big fan of Dragasevich. I think he's gonna end up being a really good NHL defenseman, but I can see why he's dropped a little. I mean, it, he hasn't dropped a ton. I mean, he's not he's not dropped like a rock, but uh nope. and he's still got tons of points. I mean, he's got 75 points in in uh, right now. So I mean, that that's ridiculous production for a defenseman. Um hasn't really slowed down. I mean, he's got a bunch of points in the last bunch of that's 10 games, but I can see where some concerns are with him. I mean, his skating can be a bit of a concern. Uh, you know, his decision making at times, uh, you know, and that and that's huge for a defenseman. I mean, you don't want him to be, you know, a liability out there. His defensively needs to be better as well. I mean, but again, uh, he's he's done a ton in the in junior right now, and you know, defenseman, and he's a right hand shot. I mean, he's again another great right hand defense that uh, teams are going to be looking at. But those concerns about, I think, defensively. And some bit of a skating could be an issue for for teams looking at him. Um, he's right from my backyard here in Richmond too, so it's kind of cool to to see another guy could potentially be in the first round coming around mm-hmm. from here. But yeah, I can see why he's fallen a bit, and I think that's the biggest thing is the skating. And for defensemen in the league right now, you have to be a good skater. I mean, you can't you can't be you can't that can't be a big weakness of yours so not saying he's a horrible skater but i've I've seen you know around where that can be uh something to look at so we'll see where he ultimately goes i think he's still a first round pick i mean i don't think he's dropping out of there but like i say i can see why he's maybe dropped a little bit and that could also be just because of the players around him too i mean that always happens where if a guy rises you have to drop someone so um but yeah Yeah, I would say that's the main reason he fell a bit on mine (laughs) was that it's just so many players that I was more excited about than him. It's not that he's been playing poorly. Like you said, he's just racking up the points like crazy. One of the top defenseman scorers in that league, only behind a couple already drafted players. Um, Yeah, I mean, he's got great hands, good passing, hockey IQ, all that stuff. It's just the skating, which limits him on defense and offense a bit too. Um, that just has made it a little tough for me to to put him in a higher tier, I guess. Mm. Um, one last guy I'll talk about here that probably is the biggest. I haven't, I didn't crunch the numbers, but I would be willing to bet it was my biggest faller. And that's Lenny Haminaho. Uh, he's playing off in the Liga in Finland, um, racking up points again, like a very impressive rate for a draft eligible player. Um, I can't take that away from him. He's got a better points per game, higher total points than uh, Yuri Slavkovsky had last year in Liga, which is kind of a wild thing to say. The first overall pick last year, and this guy's got a better better numbers and not really being talked about in the first round. And uh, I will say, I feel like I got it wrong in my last rankings. I think I had him towards the end of the first round, but I, I've been digging in a little more, and I understand why people aren't talking about him a ton, because... 
he doesn't he's not a prospect that gets you excited about anything really you watch him play and he's good at battling around the boards and then the reason he has points is because he's really really good at battling in front of the net mm-hmm. he is and he's got a good amount of goals and, and assists uh right in close which is impressive and that is necessary in the nhl and it is uh is a good skill to have i think he can definitely be an nhl player um with that as his main skill set but nothing else pops the shot isn't really there the playmaking isn't really there skating defensive game none of that really is clicking um the offense is good so who knows what could happen i could be completely wrong about him now i could be overcorrecting and and dropping him too low but but i just kind of wanted to reestablish a balance there because uh Aminaho isn't really uh, a top guy for me anymore. Um, okay, we're going to quickly run through some quick fires and then an ad, and then we'll we'll continue with some some more draft questions. So I've got these questions for you guys you don't know about, and I am very curious your thoughts. Firstly, uh, this one takes very little pre- preparation. I need you guys to go on the record with your prediction for which NHL team is going to win the draft lottery this year first overall who is going to win the first overall pick go on the record make your official prediction <laughs> and i'm going to save these and i want to know what you guys think is going to happen so matt oh. which nhl team do you think is going to get the first overall pick this year i guess in theory it could be a team that doesn't even win the lottery uh last place you don't technically need to win the lottery to get it if other teams win the lottery and like win other picks because that can happen but what are your thoughts who do you think is going to win it Oh, um, I want to say the Canucks, but that they just seem to be dropping in those odds. Um, yeah. so I'm going to go on record and say it's going to be the Montreal Canadiens and win the draft lottery again. Wow, that would be a wild one. We're gonna have some uh, some some testy NHL fans who are talking about the draft lottery being rigged two years in a row. Um, I'm sure. But uh, Peter, what are your thoughts? Which go on the record? Who is your prediction for the team that's going to win the draft lottery this year? Oh, I mean, based on the numbers, it should be the Blue Jackets. But I have a feeling that somehow the <laughs> Chicago Blackhawks are going to win it and sure. kickstart that rebuild right away. And if Jonathan Tay still plays, you know, Bedard. Playing under playing, you know, in an organization that had had what it takes to win, um, with the players that they had, with their kind of like, I mean, not necessarily a dynasty, but in today's terms for the cap era, it is it that Chicago Blackhawks team was a dynasty with the changes they made and everything like that with mm-hmm. their bottom six, but kept their core intact. Um, yeah, I, I I I just have a feeling that it could be Chicago. Fair. Yeah. I'm going to, I mean, it's kind of unfair, but I I'm starting to believe it more and more. I'm saying the Columbus blue jackets are going to win the first overall pick. I just got too excited by that Kent Johnson goal and the possibility <laughs> of watching yeah. uh, Johnson in his prime playing with Bedard in his prime. And that is just a nasty combo. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, both of them are like undersized centermen that have a good chance of playing the wing in the NHL. Yeah. But if one of them can just land as a centerman, and the other play on their wing, that is just like unfair. And I think it would be a ton of fun. Uh, So I'm going with Columbus Blue Jackets. Uh, I've got one more here, uh, a little more thinking involved in this one, but I want you guys to tell me a prospect that you think could surprise a lot of people by being selected with a lottery pick, a top 16 pick on draft day. Someone that people wouldn't expect to see the name that high, but you think could maybe jump in there. I'll go first just to give you a second. And this one might seem way off the board, but I'm becoming a bigger and bigger fan. And I think he'll continue to rise and has a good shot. And that's Oscar Fisker Molgard. <laughs> one of my favorite mm. names. I don't know what it's called because I couldn't find it when I was searching it up, but uh, he's, he's Danish, I believe. Oh boy. I hope I got that right. <laughs> oh boy. The Nord, the Nordic countries are getting upset with me right now. Um, but uh, the O in Molgard has a cross through it, and I couldn't find what that is when I searched it up. There doesn't seem to be a name for it. I'm sure there's a proper name for it, but it just looks cool. Um, anyway, he's a great player. He's playing in the SHL this year, and he's the second line center for a good SHL team, which is wild. Um, 
I've been really impressed with him and everything I've heard about him. He's very mature, very, he takes his development and his game very seriously. Um, and there's a lot of similarities and things that remind me of Marco Casper, who went eighth overall last year. He was rising and rising all year. People thought maybe a top 20 pick, maybe top 16. And then he went eighth overall. So I wouldn't be surprised if Fisker Molgard is similar. That's my guy. Um, Matt, I'll come to you next here. Who's a prospect you think could surprise people by going in the top 16 this year? Uh, I don't think Matthew would be a surprise, so I'm not going to go with him. Uh, ah, my gosh, it is a hard one. Uh, there's quite a few guys um, just looking. I'm going to go with. I go with Charlie Strom, Strom, Strommel, uh, or Strammel, how you say his name. Um, no real big thing. I think it's just because there's quite a few teams that are in that top 15 range that love these types of players uh, from the USNDP, um, NCAA. Um, you know, Philadelphia Flyers come to mind immediately because they seem to always pick these types of guys. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if they went with a guy like Strom, Strom, Strammel. So, I'm going to go with him because of uh, just the fact, not because of, I think, I think he's got a lot of skill to be a first round talent as well. Um, but I think just the teams in that top 16 range, there's a few that I could see picking him in that, uh, that spot. Yeah. He was definitely someone else. I was thinking he's, he's got the size and strength that you could see someone wanting in a, in a center prospect. And you know what, if you believe there's, a good amount more offense to give there. And he can be like a solid middle six center that that could be worth it in the top 16. Wouldn't be too surprised to see him go there. Uh, I wouldn't do it, but I wouldn't be too surprised either. <laughs> um, Peter, what do you think? Who's a prospect that could go in the top 16 that no one would expect? I, a lot of, a lot of like, from what I see, a lot of outlets have him. you know, in the 20 to 32, but I wouldn't be surprised to see Ethan Gauthier make his way into the top 16. Mm -hmm, yeah. Um, not again, this isn't just based on because you know he's one of the top names in this draft, but he has the energy, he has the you know ability to get in on the four check. He's gritty, he's in your face, he's intense, he's tough to play against. Um and not, not only that, he's decent production for that type of player. And, you know, he stood out. For, he was one of my favorite players at the Helenka Gretzky Cup in the summer. And he stood out big time. So, um, obviously, teams like that kind of intensity. They like that puck possession style game. They like the fact that players want to get in involved in on the attack. And he does that very, very consistently. So, um I, I, he just seems like a name that will stand out that could get into that top 16 for sure. Yeah, that's a good one too. Um, I'll give one last name, someone that I feel like um, maybe just hasn't been talked about a ton because he's missed some time with injuries. And when he was at the world juniors, he got hurt, didn't play a ton. And that's Samuel Honzek playing for the Vancouver Giants. Yeah. This yeah. is his first year in North mm -hmm. America and he's been tearing it up in the WHL. Again, he before his injury, he was in the top five, top 10 of WHL scoring. Big winger, played some time at center this year. So, you know, that could be a possibility that teams are excited about. Big, strong, skates well, shoots well, passes well. He's good at pretty much everything. He's kind of like a bigger Edward Shala almost. I don't know. This is not <laughs> super similar, but, but some things track there. And uh, I think if he didn't get injured at the World Juniors, you see a little more of him there. He's healthy, plays a full season in the WHL and uh, is near the top of the standings or the, the scoring lead in the WHL. I think he'd have a little more attention, but I'm thinking people just won't be super familiar with the name. So when, I don't know, who has the uh, the Senators picks, the Coyotes, when the Coyotes take them at like 13th, 14th overall, people are going to be like, who? <laughs> I, I, think it'd, I think it'd be a good pick at that range, but um, he's someone that I think is surprised. Or any of the Russian players, because... Yeah. They're kind of yeah. wild cards a little bit, like Simashev, Gulyayev. They're a little wild cards because nobody knows who they are. Hmm. <laughs> we don't get to see them play against anyone but each other. So it's like, yeah. what's going yeah. on here? But <laughs> anyway, uh, as I mentioned, we're just going to take a little break here, go through an ad, and we'll get back to a couple things. I just want to mention this episode is brought to you by our sponsor, Hockeypedia, the Hockey Writers Hockeypedia. Have you ever been looking for details on a player that just competed at the World Juniors that we just talked about? 
Uh, do you want to know who owns the New York Islanders? Do you wonder how many prospects taken in the first round by the Vegas Golden Knights have been traded away? It's almost all of them. Uh, are you curious what the NHL awards are and what their history is, who's their, who they're named after, stuff like that? Uh, if you're interest, interested in these or any other hockey-related questions, make sure you check out and bookmark the Hockey Writers Hockeypedia. It's an ever-growing collection of hockey resources that is invaluable to any fan looking for information. Look for a link in the show description and dive in today. Awesome. So just got a couple questions here and then a quick fire question and we'll we'll get on our way. Uh, so first one, this is a long explanation. I just, <laughs> this is just something I've been thinking about. And we talked a little bit about this just before we started the show today. Um, I'm just curious. I'm, I would love to have a conversation about uh, kind of your methodology almost with draft rankings, you guys. So imagine this, you're the general manager of an NHL team. You're selecting in the top 10 of the draft. What do you focus on more with your pick upside or certainty, because that's the balance that you're trying to make. You look at a player and you're like, if they have the same upside, this the same ultimate potential, but one of them you're a lot more certain will get there. That's the guy you take. Mm. Obviously, in that case, that's how it works. But it's a balance back and forth. Um, say there's a player you think is a pretty safe bet to be a top six winger, someone like Colby Barlow. Uh, do you take him? Or if there's a player that has a higher chance of not working out at all, but also has a higher chance of being like a legit top line caliber guy, maybe like Andrew crystal, who is a little more volatile, but if he hits like, he's going to be an elite NHL player, which one of those guys do you take? Which do you view more highly beforehand? I guess it's, it's different if you're actually a general manager compared where it's your job depends on your choice here <laughs> um, compared to just your thoughts as a writer, as you guys are, what are your thoughts on that balance balancing upside versus certainty? Uh, Peter, what, what do you think? I definitely think it's a bit of both. Cause obviously, you know, you want it, see certainty is really difficult to try and get a hold of because not many players are very certain of reaching that potential unless you're probably like Colby Barlow who like matured and aged a little bit quicker than other players but then again his upside is so extremely tremendous like tremendous with the value that he has being that top six winger but an all situational kind of player um obviously it, you you with players, obviously, you don't want to rush them. You wanted them to take their time. But if someone's ready to jump in right away, why not take them? Especially if you're a team that's not necessarily struggling right now, but if you also if you're a playoff team and you have a, sp- a roster spot possibly opening any opening up, and you can take someone on, why not? But Upside, it, it seems like there's a lot more to gain because, yes, he is sort of like Andrew Crystal right now. Yes, he's dominating in the WHL right now, but can he do more? And he, most likely, chances are he will do more. We saw that with even Logan Stankoven yesterday, like, well, not yesterday, but last season uh, or two two years ago. Sorry, what am I? I'm a little, little, little off there. It all but, goes uh, together. It's okay. Yeah, yeah. You, you know what I'm trying to say, right? Obviously, different players, but in Stankoven's case, it was because of his size. They weren't sure if he was able to translate or manage the physicality and handle it well. And yet, lo and behold, look what's happening right now. You know, he comes in and he's like above a two point per game pace and he's only played like what thir- between 30 and 40 games. Mm-hmm. Like yeah. that's absolutely insane. Mm-hmm. So if you're able to find that player that can battle their way through and work on their, you know, their shortcomings and deficiencies and try and improve on everything and develop properly, then yeah, the upside is definitely going to be a major factor for sure. Yeah. I kind of feel like, it's like you need to set your minimum bar for Mm -hmm. upside and your minimum bar for certainty. And as long as they're above both of those minimums, then you go for whoever's maybe probably go for whoever has Mm -hmm. the most upside. Maybe Mm -hmm. Um, it's tougher with a high pick though, because you very, there's more pressure to get someone who's going to work out. Um, And so it comes down to trying to figure out which, which skills and attributes, whether it's a physical attribute or, or like a mental thing or a physical skill um, is the biggest separator between NHL players and guys that don't make it. And then you have to try to find guys who have mm-hmm. that younger, 
But then some guys develop that after they turn 18. Big surprise. People aren't done growing and changing as a human when they turn 18. It's like some guys figure it out a little later and it does work out. Some guys, it never develops further. So it's, mm-hmm. it's you know, it's impossible, but like <laughs> you do your best. Um, Matt, what are your thoughts on kind of the upside versus certainty balance? Yeah, it's it's a tough one, especially when you're looking at it in a vacuum where you're saying, okay, if you were a GM, there's a lot of stuff like your scouting staff and your player development. And mm-hmm. I think that's a lot that goes into it. If you're looking at a guy like Andrew Crystal and you're saying, well, he's got great upside. Can can our player development team work with him to, mm-hmm. to make sure that upside is hit? Um, you know, the same thing with Colby Barlow. I mean, you're like, well. If our if he's ready to come in right away, can we develop that parts of his game that aren't polished? I mean, mm-hmm. I think that's the biggest thing is is can and that, that's why there's certain players that get picked and you're like, why were they picked there? Well, it's because they think they can develop that part of their game. Um, that maybe other teams maybe say, okay, we can't even deal with that. So I mean, it is a tough balance. I mean, upside and certainty in the top ten, I think you go for more of the certainty, in my opinion, because you're like, well, you know, you have to hit on a top 10 pick. I mean, that's huge. Although, <laughs> having said that, you pick a guy with a huge upside and then they hit on it and you're like, okay, he was worth that top 10 pick. But yeah. then you look at it and he doesn't. And you're like, well, why the heck didn't they pick this guy? Because now he's a superstar in the NHL. So, I mean, it's it's a tough, it's tough. But I think there's a lot that goes into it, like I said, with scouting staff, with your player development. Um, that that goes into that as well yeah I, I like I like the mention of player development there because teams do look at prospects and scouts will talk to other members of the staff and be like this is the problem that I see when he's skating like Andrew Crystal the one of the bigger issues aside from his size is the skating um I wouldn't say one of the bigger issues maybe one of the only because mm. he's an excellent prospect um Um, and you could talk to the skating coach, say you work for Vancouver Canucks, you're picking 10th overall, you talk to your skating coaches, your, your skills coaches. And you're like, this is the problem I see. What do you see as the problem? How do you typically develop that with guys and work on that? How does that go? How far do they come in a certain amount of time? And you get an idea for what the whole organization is going to be able to do for this player. It's not just maybe the head coach or what the GM thinks it's there's a lot of moving parts, a lot of members of the organization that are going to have a big say in what that player becomes. Um, who knows, maybe you interview the the junior head coach or something or anything like that. There's, there is a lot that goes into evaluating upside. And I guess upside does, like you were saying, Matt, it does also include the ability to hit. So it's almost certainty again, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, it's a tough balance. I, I think I agree with you, Matt, that certainty is weighed slightly heavier in a really early pick, just the pressure of actually getting a legit player. Cause like they went for upside, but you look back on uh, the Detroit Red Wings in the 2018 draft and you're like, what were they thinking? Taking Phillips Zadina there. Yeah. They thought he was going to be like a 30, 40 goal scorer consistently. And he has not quite figured it out yet, not put that together. And you look, it's like, why didn't they take Quinn Hughes? That would solve so many problems for them. That would have changed the franchise. But, you know, they took a big swing. Sometimes you miss. Uh, but that's what happens when you go for upside. It can hit, no doubt. But um, you, can, you can definitely miss. Uh, so I'm curious, you guys' thoughts, though, on uh, how this uh, kind of calculation changes. Because I know it changes a lot in my eyes. Matt, what do you think about like the balance between upside and certainty with like a mid to late round pick? Like you're maybe in the fourth round and later. Like, what do you think? What what do you aim for there? What do you think? <laughs> well, that's where I go for upside. Um, because you're you're not probably you're not gonna hit on these guys in fourth beyond the fourth round. You're like kind of throwing darts. You're like, okay, hopefully <laughs> I'm gonna hit something here. And again, uh, scouting and goes into this as well, because your your scouts say, well, I really love this player. I think he's got great upside. And or maybe they even say, well, I, I'm certain he's going to become a top six guy. I mean, not a lot of guys, not a lot of teams think this, but I do. And if the GM goes and says, I trust this guy, he's hit on a bunch of my picks in the past. Let's go for it. And, you know, that and that's a big thing. 
But this is where you take those swings in the fourth, fifth round. You go for the smaller, more skilled guy. You're like, well, he may not hit, but if he does, he's going to be like, well, Braden Point. I mean, you know, that type of guy. Um, mm-hmm. Point wasn't drafted that much further down. But, you know, he's looking at what he does now. First round pick all the way. But, I mean, there probably was a scout that told the GM and said, well, he's got great upside. I mean, not a lot of teams think this, but I think he's going to become this great uh, NHL player. And that's where they pick him. So I think you go for that more riskier picks in the fourth round and beyond because of the fact that, you know, not a lot of those guys hit anyway. So you're like, well, if they do, we've got a great, great player here. So, yeah, for me, it's upside uh, as you get deeper into the draft. Yeah, I get that. I, I can definitely agree with you there. Peter, what are your thoughts when you're picking closer in the late rounds? You're looking at guys in the fourth round and later. That balance between upside and certainty, does that change a lot for you a little bit? It does because the first round is, I mean, it's counterintuitive because I said upside for the first round, but when you're comparing to the other rounds, you're more certain to get NHL players in the first and maybe even the early parts of the second round than you are the third, fourth, fifth, because that percentage starts to go down. So yeah, I, I agree with Matt. You definitely look for the upside type of player um, because you could find that hidden gem and maybe, you know, there's you have a player in mind that still should be in a first or second round position, but fall down and, or so what have you, maybe it's a player in the second or third, you have them high on your list. No teams take them, but he's still there in the fourth or fifth round. Um, you know, I don't mean to be a Homer here, but kind of like what happened with Ty void in the Maple Leafs, you know, I personally had him as a fourth rounder Maple Leafs had, took him into fifth they probably had him higher on the, on their list and when they had their selection because they only had three picks took him and now look at him we're starting to see some upside and untapped potential in Ty Voigt's game so there's that possibility where they had they're really high in a player in a later round such in those type of situations and yeah they're going to take with the best or the player with the best skill set best upside that they possibly can to try and put them over the top because certainty is a not is basically a non-existent factor at, at those stages of the draft. Yeah. I, I agree with you there that that certainty kind of goes out the window at a certain point in the draft mm-hmm. where you're just like, it's pretty unlikely that this guy makes an NH, a difference in the NHL. So we want to find the guy that if he does is going to make the biggest difference. Um, and that's why you see teams like, like Detroit has, no shortage of left-handed defense prospects. They've got so many that half of them have played in the ECHL this year, <laughs> and they have more in like college and junior hockey and stuff. And in last year's draft, they took another, I think, two left-handed defensemen because it wasn't like this is a weakness we have. We have to fill this with a guy that's going to play for us in the NHL. It's there's some things that are exciting about this prospect, and probably not going to hit in the NHL. But if he does, this could be a legit player for us. And certainty is not the biggest part of the conversation anymore you're just trying to find someone that if it works out they'll be the most exciting Mm. i don't know that's that's interesting i appreciate you guys thoughts on that um that's all i have actually for the second half here so we're going to go off to our last quick fire question um and i need you guys to tell me a prospect or like seven Uh, whose name literally just the name like divorce their name from anything about their game i don't care if they're good or bad if i don't care if they're going to be drafted or not a prospect in this year's draft whose name just makes you happy a little bit whose name is just like really cool or make gives you a little giggle or something i mentioned him earlier but my favorite is oscar fisker molgard you've got the the o with the cross through it and the double a in molgard and it's awesome i'm a big fan uh what are your guys thoughts matt what's what's the, a name or two or three <laughs> well like? first i've mentioned it before william whitelaw i love that name i uh, the alliteration you've got uh I, you type it into google you'll get some law offices so uh <laughs> and, and until he gets written about more obviously but uh, right now, he's he, on the first page, you're going to be at a law office. So, I mean, that... nice. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that one's a big one for me. I, you know, otherwise, I won't take away some of Peter's. Peter's got a couple more, so I'll, I'll hand it over. <laughs> sure. And, and, then, and then we'll just 
rotate around <laughs> with our favorites. That's that's fair. Peter, Peter, what do you think? What's a name you just really enjoy? Oh, I got, I got, I definitely have a few. I definitely have a few. Um, I know definitely one is Matthew Manaya, and obviously it's not, it, it's it falls in line with Mania, but it's pronounced <laughs> Manaya. And coincidentally enough, he just scored a goal today. So, um, <laughs> there we go. Um, it's a great one. <laughs> it is, and it's kind of like you know Matthew Mania kind of thing. You know, <laughs> again, kind of like yeah. with winning White Law, the alliteration and the fact that Mania going crazy. <laughs> Obviously, he's not. Gonna, it would be great if he would be like a top round prospect, but he's kind of like more to that second, third round kind of thing. But you know yeah. what? It, it's still fun to say. Um, I will say that Jason Shagabe is another one, Ooh. as well as. Uh, this one it kind of ties in because he does have an older brother. There's another Jack High, Florian. So obviously we Ooh. know how great his uh how Florian. great his name is. And one more. And I and I promise you this is just one more. Um I really like uh where where am I? Uh Anton Wahlberg. And it's Ooh. not just because of his name, the last name obviously goes back to Mark Wahlberg actor kind of thing and I, I mean kind of like whole will smith and will smith the actor and the player you don't want to tie them together but you know i yeah. just to see the exact same spelling with Wahlberg. it kind of just like you know i, I i'm a big fan totally. of some of mark Wahlberg's movies especially <laughs> with his stuff in the departed so you know what to see that see anton's name there that's th- those are just a few of mine those are some great ones matt do you have any any extras that come to mind now that you let you so graciously let me take this turn. <laughs> Took everybody, basically. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I I like the Aiden Celebrini because it's you know celebrate oh, yeah. celebrate Celebrini yeah. and all of it depends Solid. on what I want to go. Um, I, yeah, just looking through uh, any Matthew, all the Matthews and any the Matthews. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. I'm also I'm a big fan of Oliver Bonk. It's a good name. Yes. And then the one that like makes me like question my pronunciation every single time I say it is Grayson Sachin. Like try spelling that name by memory and you will question everything. Um, it, I don't know why it's so difficult. Maybe it's just me, but it's just I struggle with that name, but I really enjoy it. There's a lot of CYNs going on in there and you don't see those nearly often enough. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. That's a fun thing. I don't want to, I I'm glad nobody just like said like a very normal sounding like Russian name. And you're like, it sounds funny. <laughs> like you don't want to like make fun of a different name just because it's in a different no. language. It's just bonk is really funny to me. That just sounds really funny. Anyway, <laughs> that's not what it's about. We're not making fun of names. We're just no happy about them. Anyway, uh, we're going to move on to our last segment, the way we love to end our show each week. We're each going to go over our prospect of the week. And we're getting to the point now where it's playoffs for junior leagues. Some are even over. You know, there's going to be less hockey happening. So it's going to become more and more just prospects we're excited about. Not necessarily someone who is great that week or something (laughs) like that. Um, Matt, I'll come to you first because I know yours is a little topical. with some, Some player in the news with the Vancouver Canucks. I'll let you take over there. Who do you got? All right. Well, uh, the Canucks just signed this guy this morning uh, as we record here. So uh, I thought it's pretty topical, like you said. So Max Sasson or Sasson, I, I I haven't, I'm pretty sure that's how you pronounce it, but probably not. But uh, he's a, you know, university uh, or NCAA player that was just uh, signed by the Canucks. And He's he wasn't the big guy that uh, everyone wants. Jake Livingston was the guy that everyone wants the Canucks to sign. Doesn't look like it's going to happen. But this guy has some. I mean, he's not a massive point producer. I mean, he had 15 goals, 42 points. That's pretty good mm-hmm. uh, in in it. But I don't think he's going to be a, that type of guy in the NHL. Very solid 200 foot player. Uh, could potentially be a third, fourth line center in the NHL. I mean, none of these NCAA guys are guys you're going to be like, oh, they're going to be top line guys. I mean, you never know. I mean, they could, but uh, he's 22 years old. So he's kind of getting up there. I say up there in age, but he he's older. <laughs> he's an older prospect, uh, sure. but he's got, he's got great upside as being a penalty killer. Uh, that two way second or two way third line center that the Canucks need. Um, like I say, I'm not sure he's going to hit that, 
but uh, he's got he's got that upside to be that type. He's six one. He's got pretty good size. Um, so I mean, and he was he was on a lot of lists for teams looking at uh, at these types of guys. It's not like he came out of nowhere that the Canucks would be like, well, "Who is this NCAA free agent?" But there were some a lot of teams looking at him, and uh, you know, and you know the way that he's got his skill set is that of a good, like I say, third line center and. That is an easier time of hitting in the NHL and then looking at, like, oh, he's going to be a top yeah. six. Um, he And this is where these free agents probably fall into the that bottom six, um, bottom pairing defense. I mean, if you're signing these guys, even Livingston, I don't think he's going to be a top line, top pairing defenseman. He's going to be a probably a good third pairing uh, guy, which is pretty good for a NCAA free agent. But mm-hmm. I'm going to say that with Sasson as well. He's going to be that uh, good bottom six center. So really excited to see what he can do. He probably won't play in the NHL this year. He's was sent down to the Abbotsford Canucks, uh, bolster their playoff mm-hmm. roster. Who, I mean, he, he he's going to be really good. I, I think he's going to be a good, um, he's got some upside. So we'll see what happens. But uh, the first NCAA free agent the Canucks have signed, um, and we'll see if there's any more to come. Yeah, absolutely. I I will say 22 in the prospect world is basically ancient. Like he's <laughs> like they're ready to put him in a assisted living care facility or something. You're so old at 22. Um, but also I I I agree with you. I think it's a really solid pick for the Canucks, especially when you look at their bottom six centers right now, and you've got like Niels Oman and is it Sheldon Dries? Yeah, kind of filling out the bottom six center. It's like there's not. The most competition, obviously, they're hoping to have Atu Ratu break in there probably next season. Um, but give yourself a few more chances, a few more guys that have the potential. Yeah. And and he's he's at a great age for someone that if he if he makes it in their bottom six, uh, so it's a really solid solid pick. Someone that could be with the team for a long time. So I think that's a cool spot. Yeah, um, I will quickly mention my prospect of the week is Carter Yakumchuk, plays in the WHL for the Calgary Hitmen. Um, if he was, I can't remember the exact number of days, if he was like two weeks older, I think he'd be in the first round of this year's draft, um, but he's not eligible until 2024, which means he'll be one of the older players in that draft. Uh, well, one of the very oldest, um, but he's been excellent. He's probably, the Hitmen are not great this year. I live in Calgary. Trust me, they're not great, um, but he's been <laughs> probably their best player all season He's a, a right hand shot defenseman, six foot two, legit NHL skating quality, um, good offensive skills. Uh, I think you're going to hear a lot about him for the next year. And uh, he's an early, you know, you can never be so sure because um, Cam Allen was kind of in a similar spot and fell off the face of the planet when it comes to draft talks. But he seems like a, a good bet early on to be a first rounder next year. Uh, so Carter Yakumchuk, keep keep an eye out for him in the WHL next season. Uh, Peter, who's your prospect of the week this week? My prospect of the week this week is Detroit Red Wing fourth rounder in 2022, Amadeus Lombardi. And obviously his, like, obviously we know how great the Red Wing system is with all the players that they have, but they may have found somebody that's laid around with some untapped potential because he has 102 points a season behind both Matthew Maggio and Ty Voigt. Um, Actually, just looking at both of their, you know, draft histories, both Maggio and Voigt are fifth round picks in the NHL and OHL. But I digress with that. <laughs> um, that's not what that, that's not what I'm here to talk about. What I am here to talk about is the fact that uh, Lombardi, with his 102 points, he has set the record for mm-hmm. single season leader in points and assists in the Flint Firebird, Flint Firebirds franchise. And this is just about a year or so after. Brennan Othman initially set that mark with 91 points. So obviously Lombardi making some history there as well, but even just overall with his uh, gameplay and what I've seen, he's just quick. He's, he has a, a, he just oozes skill. And and the fact that he was gone or he dropped at a fourth round, I mean, don't want to say necessarily drop because last year the draft is still a lot of movement and everything like that. But for the uh, Red Wings to try to take them 113th overall is absolutely a great value of what they're trying to see right now. Um, you know, he goes from 
uh, 59 points in his draft year to 102 right now. So he <laughs> definitely found it, uh, a new sort of stride to his game and offensive production there. So um, I've just been impressed with what I've seen with him this se- uh, this season and to this point as well. But the fact that he's in the record books as, as well, just solidified him as my prospect of the week. Yeah. It's a solid pick too. Speaking of names that make you happy, Amadeus Lombardi. <laughs> yeah. Top tier <laughs> name. That is. Um, yeah. yeah. He's been, he's been great. Uh, I will say one thing that I, uh, I'm not trying to like throw cold water on Red Wings fans that are excited, but I was just trying to help people set expectations fairly <laughs> for a guy. Um, he actually went undrafted in 2021, which was his first year of eligibility because he didn't play a single game. The OHL didn't play. Yes. Yes. Uh, missed that year. Uh, not necess- I wouldn't say, you know, some people say like missed a year of development. I don't know if that's true. You could still work out. You could still learn a lot, but missed a year of games, which is mm. important. So his first full OHL season, like you yes. mentioned, Peter, he was roughly a point a game, which was mm-hmm. pretty impressive, kind of wild. He didn't go sooner, uh, but the Red Wings took that pick and it's paid off already. It's looking real solid. Um, so he's 19 now, almost 20. Um, so he's not one year post draft technically he is but he's not you know but um, let, let's still very COVID, exciting yeah i was yeah, just about to say let's take that covid year let's take that covid year out of it because you know not everybody was on top of their game as well so yeah. And, yeah. and missing a whole season especially in the ontario hockey league did put a damper on things so yeah for sure but yeah. he's been incredible very mm-hmm. exciting ever since i saw him in the uh the post draft like prospect tournament for uh like development camp for the yeah. Red Wings when they did a little scrimmage and he scored a lacrosse goal in like a three on three game. I was like, okay, <laughs> I'm gonna remember that name. <laughs> uh, so that's a great call out there. Uh all right. Well, that's gonna do it for us this week. Thank you all for tuning in to another episode of Prospect Corner. Make sure you subscribe to the Hockey Raiders YouTube channel, which is down below there. And make sure just to make sure you don't miss the rest of our episodes leading up to the draft and beyond. Um, also, make sure you check out our site, thehockeywriters.com, for tons of draft coverage over the last month and over the next forever months, the next three plus. Um, uh, also, make sure you check out Hockeypedia on thehockeywriters.com. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Peter. Thank you all for watching. And we'll see you all next week on another episode of Prospect Corner. Thanks. Bye.